All right, here we go. Today, my title for today, we're continuing in our simple series, is Martha and Mary. Now, you probably are saying, you mean Mary and Martha, and you're not wrong, but when you look at it in Scripture, especially in Luke chapter 10, where we're going to be looking today, it says Martha and Mary. Uh, And so, in this simple series, if you haven't been here, if you've, you know, kind of been in and out a little bit, when, when we're in this series of simple, it doesn't necessarily mean uncomplicated, but, but it kind of does. But really, it's this simple instruction on how to live as followers of Jesus. Like, like I, I just want to kind of take all of the difficulty away and just really look at God's Word and say, God, what do you want to speak to us? What are some simple principles that we can take away today Uh, and just apply them to our lives, and hopefully they will change us. So, everybody got your Bibles? Luke chapter 10, we're just going to read a handful of verses there. We're going to depart from these verses, go check out some other passages, and then we're going to come back and land back on this passage here. Luke chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 38. So it says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, what I want us to get here in the beginning, we're going to go point number one and then kind of really change directions for point two and three. I want us to understand that Jesus was very good friends with this family. Now, you wouldn't necessarily know it by reading this passage, so what do we do when we read through a passage or we we read through maybe some instruction and you're like, that's kind of weird, I don't really understand that. What is the best way to understand Scripture? We say it all the time. What do you do? What do you compare it with? Other Scripture. You look and see if there's other Scripture that maybe aligns with this, talks about Martha and Mary, talks about their relationship, right? Um, So Jesus was really, really close friends with Martha, Mary, and their brother. Who was their brother's name? Lazarus. Okay, so now some light bulbs are going off. This very same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead, right? So what would happen, and we've we've said this before, is that Jesus lived up in the north, up in Galilee, okay, by the Sea of Galilee. He, during his ministry years, he lived in a, a town called Capernaum, probably stayed at Peter's house, and you can go there where they believe it was Peter's house today, and he would stay up in the north, but when he would travel to Jerusalem, which was pretty often, he would go there for all the festivals and the feasts and all of that. When he would travel to Jerusalem, when he would stay there, he would stay in a little town called Bethany at uh, Martha and, see, I'm even going to do it, Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary and Lazarus's house. And that is where most scholars believe that Jesus stayed, maybe not every single time, but Jesus spent a lot of time with these people, okay? Um, We can see it in John chapter 11, verse 21, how close they were. It says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus. Now, Jesus is entering the town. This is that story where he goes to heal Lazarus. Remember, he purposefully waited for Lazarus to die. Sounds like a great friend, right? He waited for him to die so that he could go and raise him from the dead. So John eleven twenty one 21 says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And then just a few verses later, Mary catches up to Jesus and she says almost the exact same thing. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So then we look at John chapter 12, verse 1. 
It says six days before Passover, and this is right before Jesus's crucifixion, Jesus came to Bethany. Here's another one of his trips, and he stays with them, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus's honor. Mary served, which we saw that today already, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like Jesus had this relationship with them, this very, very close bond uh, with this family. Now, question, is it a little bit kind of strange to think that Jesus actually had friends? Because really 99% of the life that we know of Jesus was his ministry years, right? Like year 30 to 33 and he was crucified. Like he was pretty busy at that time, right? I love, I think, how John puts it right at the end of the book. He's like, These are, this is an account of all the things that Jesus did, but really, if I wrote down everything that he did, like there, there wouldn't be enough room to write everything down. Like Jesus was busy. But I want us to think about it for a second. Jesus actually had friends. Jesus had people that he was close to. Now we're like, okay, yeah, I mean, he had the disciples, and, and, and he even calls them his friends. We see that. Uh, and we'll see that today in a verse. But like, I really need us to get this concept that Jesus, while on this earth, had friends and friendships and just people that he liked doing life with. But here's why that's important. Because the God of the universe in human form had personal friends. See, we've, we've got to get this understanding in our minds that like, like God Almighty, creator and sustainer of all things, when he came down to this earth in human form, he actually had friendships that went beyond his ministry. And things change when we understand that. So that brings us to our first point. Number one, Simple followers of Jesus understand that God desires relationship and friendship with us. Now, I say this a lot, okay? I'm admitting, I say this, one of the most things that I say, I don't know if that makes any sense of what I just said. One of the things that I say the most is this, how about that, okay? That God desires a friendship and relationship with you. Now, if somebody says something over and over and over and over again, and I only get like 30 to 40 minutes of your time every week, it's probably important, right? Like if, if I'm going to take that much effort to tell you God desires a friendship and relationship with you, it's important. But why? Why is this so important for us to understand this? Well, there's a very, very specific reason. See, when we believe that God wants a relationship with us, when, when we come to that conclusion and understanding like, okay, God actually wants me to be his friend, it changes the way we think. It changes the way that we see him. It, it makes us transition from oh, God just cares about rules, or God does, doesn't really have time for me, or, or okay, I know that he, he wants me to believe and trust in him, but like, in, I mean, there's like, you know, eight billion people on the earth, right? Is that what we said? And like, like, he doesn't really have time for me. He doesn't really care that much about me. But when we really truly understand and concept the fact that Jesus wants to be a personal friend with you, it makes you see him differently. It makes you trust him differently. Look at John chapter 15, starting in verse 13. We all know this verse. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is Jesus speaking, of course. And he goes on, he says, you are my friends 
if you do whatever I command. Now, don't get too caught up in the do whatever you command. Don't think of it like a master. Jesus is saying, hey, if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna be in my family, if we're gonna be in relationship, you're gonna listen, you're gonna do what I say because what I'm trying to do is, is move you forward. I'm trying to bless you in a way that it is gonna give you the best life possible. So he says, greater love is no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made, I have made known to you. Write this down. Understanding God's desire for friendship changes the way we see him and respond to him. When we understand that God truly desires this relationship with us, it just changes the way we see him. It, it changes the way we respond to him. It changes the way we obey what he puts in his word because we don't look at it like, oh, it's just a bunch of rules and, it, you know, he doesn't really want me to have fun or, you know, I mean, like I have my life separate from God and all that. No, no, no. It's like, this is absolutely what I want to follow in life because God wants the best for me because that's what friends do. Friends want the very, very best for you, a true friend. And we all have some friends that, eh, right? Anybody got those friends? Don't raise your hand. You're probably sitting next to them, okay? A friend wants the best for you. But see, a master wants the best for himself, that's the difference. A friend is willing to say and do the hard things to protect you. Anybody have those friends? Like they are willing to say the hard stuff. That's a really, really, really good friend. A master is going to take the easy route and probably protect himself. That's the difference between a friend and a master. And Jesus right here is saying, hey, you're my friends. If you're in my family, if you're doing what I command, if you're following me, you're my friend. I call you a friend. Simple followers of Jesus understand that God desires relationship and friendship with us. All right, so back to our original story in Luke chapter 10 with Martha and Mary. So again, these were dear friends of Jesus. They often stayed at their house and they spent a lot of time together. Now, when we read this story, we usually see two different characters in the story, right? We see Martha and we see Mary. Now, normally we think of Martha as the servant, the hard worker, right? She's the provider. She's probably the oldest one. So, you know, she's, she has that responsibility to do. So that's how we see Martha. Mary you know, we just kind of see her sitting around. She doesn't really care about making these preparations. Um, you know, she just wants to chill. Um, what's another word for that? What's a little more derogatory word for that? Lazy. That's often how we see Mary. She was just kind of being lazy. Martha was doing, like they were throwing a feast. There were things that had to be done. And Mary was just kind of sitting around chilling, right? Right? So that's kind of how we see them, and Jesus really just flips this upside down. So this reminds me of this true story. Um, it was this kid, and he had a really, really hard time waking up in the morning, and, and, and no matter what his mom did, like, like she couldn't get him to understand, like, it's, it's really good, it's a good habit to wake up early in the morning. And so um, one day his mom, she, she was like, I have an idea, I want to teach him the benefits of waking up early in the morning. She's like, son... I want to tell you this story, and when I'm done, I want you to tell me what you've learned from the story. It's like, okay, there was these two birds. One bird, he would always wake up really early in the morning, and he would go out and find all the bugs that he wanted for he and his family to eat, and he was never hungry. The second bird, man, he slept in all the time. And, and whenever he finally did get up out of bed, he went around and he looked for worms and there was no worms to be found and he was always hungry. So son, what did you learn from this story? He thinks about it for a second. He says, well, I learned that the bugs that get up early get eaten first. <laughs> All right. So 
Traditionally, we think that Martha is like the servant, the go-getter, the doer, and Mary is a little bit lazy, but that's not true. Back to verse 38, Luke 10. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, it sounds like from Luke's teaching here that they weren't already friends, but they were. Um, Verse 39 She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, just side note, again, another freebie here. It's never a bad idea to just listen to Jesus, okay? That's never a bad thing, all right? Verse 40, but Martha was, what's that word? Distracted. As I was studying this week, I learned that this word distracted, and I don't know what the Greek word was, but this was actually a term used for torture. And what, I think it was the Romans uh, that I read about, uh, they would tie ropes to all four of your arms and legs. And they would tie the other ends to horses. And I'll let you figure out the rest of how this goes. That was called distracted basically being pulled apart. And that is the word that Luke uses here. She was making preparations. She was busy. She was doing necessary things, but she was torn apart. She was distracted. Guess what? Distraction is one of the greatest tools in the enemy's toolbox. He knows he can get you by distraction. What, what is, what's another word that we use for distraction? What, what, would, what would be common in, in our language? Busy? Yeah. Anybody feel like they're busy? Yeah. Like, and again, I'm preaching to myself here. When people come up and greet me, hey, how's it going? You know, what's, what's, what's been going on lately? You know what my standard answer that usually just automatically comes out of my mouth? Busy. I am. I'm busy. I have a lot of things going. I have a lot of balls I'm juggling up in the air, a lot of irons in the fire, however you want to say it. But I don't know that I'm really any more busy than anybody else. But that's oftentimes how I see my life. And that is often how the enemy distracts us. It's one of his greatest tools that he uses. Again, verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that, what's those next two words? Had to be made. Realize, these weren't bad things that she was doing. They were necessary They were good things, but Martha was distracted. She was torn apart by them. That brings us to our second point. Number two, simple followers of Jesus identify busy as a distraction. We have to be able to look into our lives to see if busy is just our normal answer, if busy is how we feel all of the time. Because that's what the enemy is going to use to get in there. Now, again, busy is not inherently bad, right? Can you be busy doing good things? Of course, just like Martha here. Um, Can you be busy with doing good things and not be busy doing God things? Absolutely. I say this all the time, not every good opportunity is a God opportunity. Because again, the enemy will just throw things your way that are good opportunities, but they may be distracting you away from what God has originally intended. Um, Remember last week, remember we talked about Nehemiah, and we had that picture of him up on the ladder, and, and, and his enemies sent messengers to him, and they said, hey, we want you to come down to the plains of Ono. Oh, we, we just, we want to talk, you know, everything. We want to work this out. And Nehemiah said, no, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. 
And, and, I, and I, again, I know it meant down to the plains of Ono, but I just pictured as him on that ladder saying, I'm not even going to stop working right in this moment to come down from the ladder to give you an answer. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Like we said, one of the enemy's greatest tools is distraction by busyness. It's, it's not always this dark, sin-filled life. See, that's how we often think the enemy gets at us. We think that he's going to throw all these horrible temptations at us and, and, and pull us away. But that's most of the time not how it works. He uses distraction and busyness to get at us. Now, you guys know I love you, right? And, and you guys chuckle like you know what's coming. Okay. Uh, if you don't know, I want to put it out there. I love you guys. And I want to commit to you, I am never going to hold back from saying the hard things. I am never going to not tell you what God has put on my heart. And we have talked about some really, really tough things in this church. We did a whole series called Tough Topics. Okay, so I'm never going to shy away from telling you what I feel like God has put on my heart to tell you guys. Everybody get that? Okay, with that being said, I might step on some toes this morning, okay? I just wanted to put a little warning out there. But being that distraction and busyness is one of the enemy's greatest tools that he uses. Let's look at some of our lives. Let's see if maybe we can find some of those things in our lives that we might go, oh, that's, that's my thing. Um, maybe it is a super successful business to where you are working a 50, 60, 70 hour work week. Is that a bad thing? No. And you would probably say, well, my business is blessed by God. And you're probably right. But I want to ask you a question. If you are allowing that business or busyness to get in the way of your relationship with God, if, if that is taking more time and more precedence and more mental thought and more resources and everything in your life, do you think that God's going to be continued to or be inclined to continue in blessing that job, that business? Maybe... God needs us to reprioritize just a little bit. So um, maybe your busyness or your distraction is the fact that you just love to travel all the time, like, and you're gone like many, 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 many Sundays. And I'm not saying that Sunday is your, your, should be your only connection with God. It, sh Sunday should be a very small part of your relationship with God. It's a very important part, but there should be like six other days of the week that you have a relationship with God. But oftentimes when we're drifting off, Sunday is our only connection with God. And we often allow travel or maybe work or something, and we start missing out on Sundays, which again is your real only connection with God. Um, I'm going to step on my own toes here, okay? Maybe your busyness is being a terrible time manager. I am not the best at time management. I will get caught up in something and I'll go like, oh, squirrel, right? And I am just like off to another project. Because again, when I'm here at work, okay, the staff can tell you there is a million things. Go I mean, we've got building projects going on in, in several different areas. We're selling this property. I'm always receiving emails from the attorneys. I've got to write a sermon. I've got a staff to run. I've got like all these things. And I'm like, oh, any object. And I'm just like going over there to this other thing. 
Maybe your busyness is that you're not necessarily more busy than anyone else, but you're just not a great time manager. And if you sought the Lord, maybe sought some other resources as well and said, okay, this is going to be my schedule. This is when I'm going to get up. This is when I'm going to get started. I'm going to do this, 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 this. Maybe you would be less busy and you would be more inclined to seek after God. Maybe your busyness is a fun hobby that consumes you. I mean, we all have our hobbies, right? And hobbies are great. We all need those stress relievers and, and we've got to have our downtime. I am, I am all for that. But you know, sometimes hobbies can be a little bit kind of like an addiction, like, and it just consumes us. And when you're consumed with busyness or something, you're not consumed with Jesus. Last one. Maybe your busyness is that your kids are in every single sport known to man, and they're on every travel team known to man, and you are always running like crazy. You spend like half of your salary on hotel rooms and travel and this, and it's sports, 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 sports. And I'm all for sports. I'm not saying travel teams are bad. I'm not picking on anybody for this. I'm just saying being in student ministry for as long as I was and just observing people, my girls weren't sports related, okay? So I guess I had that one going for me. We were, we were dance people in theater. Okay, so Maybe I have seen people completely consumed with this, not one iota of margin in their life because everything is about go, 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 go. Maybe it's not sports. Maybe it's something else. But we so often get ourselves into these areas of life that are just consuming and they leave little to no room for what's truly important, and that is our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And what's usually the first thing to go? That's it. Because you can't not do the sports, and you can't not go to work, and, well, I need my fishing time. I mean, I, I do, right? But I'm just saying, that's me. And oftentimes, we just kind of, I'll, I'll get... To my Bible later. I'll get to my time with the Lord. Another, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And that just continues to be a habit. So here's a couple of questions. Husbands, fathers, I'll, I'll pick on you guys for a second. You're the leaders of the home and it was Father's Day last week, so I'll kind of continue on that. But which do you think your family will succeed more from? Okay, option one, the opportunities and values your kids will learn from sports or seeing you work a 70-hour work week or any of that, do you think, and, and they're going to learn some great values and morals and all of that, I get that, but do you think they will learn more from that or do you think they will learn more from you just diving in to love Jesus with everything and to be the leader of your home that you need to be and living as an example? So when we look at your kids' lives 20, 30 years down the road, which one do you think is going to pay off more? And a hush falls across the crowd, right? But we all do it. We all get distracted. So here's two questions that we can ask ourselves that'll kind of bring this into focus. Number one, am I busy with the right things? Am, am I busy with the right things? Because remember, not all things that we're busy with are necessarily bad things. We're not, this isn't a sin, not sin conversation. Am I busy with the right things? And the second question is, we'll, we'll, we'll fine tune it a little bit here. Am I busy with things that are honoring God? It's a really, really good, important question to ask. In Psalm chapter 39, verse 4, <clears throat> David speaking here, and I love this passage. This is from the New Living Translation. It says, Lord, 
Remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Now listen to this. We are merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends in, what's that word? Nothing. All of this busyness that you are doing in life that is not honoring God will end in nothing. Yes, but it's, it doesn't matter. It will end in nothing. We heap up wealth not knowing who will spend it. And here's the answer, verse 7. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Whew. I love that. Simple followers of Jesus identify busy as a distraction. So back to Luke 10, verse 40. It says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Um, Martha, did you forget who you're talking to? Like, understand, she just spoke to, she just commanded Jesus to do something. Now, I guess two points here. You don't speak that frankly to Jesus unless, number one, you're really, really close to him, okay? And number two, you probably have a little bit of a bitter heart. But she's like, Jesus, you got to do something. This isn't, f what's that F word? Fair. This isn't fair of what's happening here. Verse 41, I love Jesus' response. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. Now, you think of the very same thing I think of when we read this, which is Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Yes, okay. So now that we have that out of the way, because I cannot read this passage without thinking that, now that that's past us, he says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. Now, when, when they said a double name back then, th there was a couple of things that were happening. Number one, it showed relationship. It showed that, that, that hey, I, I, wanna, I wanna draw you in. What I'm getting ready to tell you is really important. So, so get, get a little bit closer. I'm gonna tell you something really important. That's what Jesus was saying here. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things. Again, that would just be, you're busy. You're just, you're just being busy. So what does he do? First off, he pulls out Martha, Martha, which is like, like to us, it would be like using the first, middle, and last name, right? And anybody ever get one of those from your mom or dad? Yeah, it'd be like, Trevor Courtney, man, you get over here right now, right? Which I never heard that before, but I, I know that some people hear that before. Just saying. Some of you are probably like, your middle name is Courtney? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. I love this quote from Skip Heitzig. This quote basically says it all right here. Work without worship produces worry. When you're doing a whole bunch of work, you're doing a whole bunch of stuff, and our word for that today is busy, without worshiping God, without bringing God into the equation of whatever you're doing in life, it's going to produce worry. Because why? Because God is not there with you to walk alongside of you. And if whatever you're working at falls apart, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be crushed. Because you didn't invite God into the equation. He goes on. He says it just another way. Action without adoration produces aggravation. 
that is so good. When we're doing life and we're not just saying, hey, God, I want you to be a part of everything in my life. It doesn't mean you have to give up your busy business. It doesn't mean you have to give up your, your um, sports and all of that. It doesn't mean you have to give up your hobbies. It doesn't mean any of that. It means invite God into everything you do, every facet of what you do in life. When we invest time, resources, mental energy into things and don't involve God in that equation, what exactly do you think it's going to do when it fails? It'll produce four things. Worry, stress, anxiety, wasted time. Uh, Question, does anybody need any more of those things in your life? Raise your hand. Worry, stress, aggravation, wasted time, wasted resources. Anybody need any more of that? I, I didn't think so. None of us do. What is the remedy to that? You bring God into the equation. And the, the interesting thing is Jesus wants to be invited into every area. Um, I, I fish a lot with friends, um, especially like Pastor Pete and Glenn. And one of the things that I love about fishing with these guys is we always pray before we go out in the boat. Now, it's a good idea because there's a lot of bad things that could happen when you go out in the boat. And, um, you know, I mean, you could sink and die, um, you know, and you could not catch fish. So, I mean, they're, I, I don't know. I mean, they're right there, okay? And, um, and, and of course, okay, Pastor Pete, he's an elder. Of course, we pray. It's a bunch of us friends going out fishing. But oftentimes when I fish with Glenn, and he didn't know I was going to talk about him today, um, when I fish with Glenn, it's not just as friends. He does charters. Um, he, he, you know, takes people out, and, and it's glencounters.com if anybody's looking for a fishing trip. little, um, you know, advertisement there. I guess if I'm going to pick on him here, I'm going to give him a little uh, promo. Um, and so he takes charters, and, and I will be the mate sometimes on that. So it's, it's actually working, and it's people that he doesn't necessarily know. And when we're leaving the dock, or sometimes even before we leave the dock, he just asks them, hey, do you guys mind if we pray? And we don't know what they're going to say. Most of the time, it's uh, couldn't hurt, right? Which... It's fine, right? <laughs> you know? So, sure, it couldn't hurt. And, and, and he prays, and, and not just ask God to bless us with fish, which, yeah, okay. But like, hey, God, you know, we just, we want you to join us today. We want you to meet with us out on the boat today. He's inviting God into whatever situation that he's in. That's a, a work slash kind of play fun thing, right? And he's inviting God, say, hey, God, I want you to be a part of this part of my life. And that's, that's exactly what God wants from us. Verse 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Basically, I'm not going to stop her from sitting here doing this. Mary has chosen the thing that is better. Write this down. Sitting at the feet of Jesus today allows us to stand against the trials of the enemy tomorrow. When you sit at the feet of Jesus today, which guess what? Every day is today, isn't it? That's kind of how life works. If every day you are sitting at the feet of Jesus, meaning you are seeking him in his word, you are praying, you're saying, hey, God, what is it that you want from me today? What is it that you want from my life? Am I heading in the right direction? The things that I'm working on, are they the right things that I'm working on? And when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, when you're seeking after him in things, guess what? I I don't mean to be a a, a Debbie Downer. I'm not trying to be pessimist or anything like that but you are going to hit a storm. 
sometime soon, probably. You're going to have a trial. You're going to have something that you bump up against in life. And guess what? If you're not constantly sitting at the feet of Jesus, when you hit that storm, you will not be ready. It is going to knock you over. Unless you are rooted and grounded. And, and when you are constantly in communion with Jesus and that storm hits you, it may very well almost knock you over. It might be that bad. But guess what? It won't. But if you're not constantly walking with the Lord and that storm comes, bad things are going to happen. This leads us to our third and final point, and we'll close. Simple followers of Jesus always sit at the feet of Jesus. Always looking to have communion with Jesus. Always looking into God's word. Always looking to speak to him. Just say, Jesus, I want to honor you with every aspect of my life. Sitting at Jesus' feet means you're always seeking after his words, his wisdom, and his ways. So if I asked you to describe your life just by using a few words, and you gave me words like busy, overwhelmed, tired, worn out, run ragged, don't know if I can do it another day, I want to close with Matthew chapter 6. Uh, there are so many passages that would fit in here. It was really hard choosing the right passage. But Matthew chapter 6, the end of verse 30, Jesus is speaking here. And he says, you of little faith, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Translation, Stop being busy about all of the things that are important, but not the most important things. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Guess what? God already knows your needs. So if you're seeking after him, maybe more than all of this other stuff, maybe, just maybe, God will provide those other things, and you won't have to work so hard for them. And then there's verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, all the busy stuff that you're worried about in life, all these things will be given to you as well. You want to be a better time manager? You want to be less busy? Seek after the Lord in all things. And somehow, I hate to use the word magically, but somehow I do believe that God will step in and change things. So three characteristics of followers of Jesus. Number one, simple followers of Jesus understand that God desires relationship and friendship with us. Number two, simple followers of Jesus identify busy as a distraction. And number three, simple followers of Jesus always sit at the feet of Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being clear. We thank you that we can take one passage of just a handful of verses and find so much truth in there. God, what a difference it makes in our lives when we truly understand that you desire friendship with us, that you desire a relationship with us, not as a master servant or a master slave, but that you desire a relationship that is symbiotic, that is a friendship that benefits on both sides. God, that we can honor you and glorify you with our lives and the things that we do and, and love you and please you and honor you. And God, that you would bless us, that you would watch over us, you would protect us, you would comfort us in time of need. Thank you, God, that your word is so clear about this, that you just want us in your family. You're not looking for us just to obey a bunch of rules or just to do a bunch of things or attend a church service, but you desire daily 
constant relationship with us. So God, help us to bring you into every area of life. God, in in all of our endeavors, our work, our play, our family, all of those things, God, help us to bring you along. And God, I know there will be some things in our lives that we may have a hard time doing that that maybe you don't fit into those things. God, would you help us to understand that those might be the things that need to be removed from our lives. So God, help us to do things that honor you, that glorify you, that lift you up, that that speak your name to people as we are just living our lives. God, help them to see a difference in us. Help this broken, dying world out there, God, to see you in our actions, to see the love that we have for you and the love that you have for us back. God, help us to shine our light in a way that people would just see you. God, if there are those this morning who do not know you, who do not have this personal relationship with you right now God in this moment would you just speak to their hearts help them to understand that you are real that you are good that you are kind and that you are love God right now in this moment help them to trust that Jesus is the savior of the world and he is their personal Savior. If that's you this morning, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus, if you're just checking out this church thing or you're kind of skeptical right now, I just want to give you an opportunity to say, today's the day I want to start a relationship with Jesus. Today is the day I want to give my life to him. Trevor, if what you're saying is true, I want that. I want a God that with one in eight billion people, he desires relationship with me. So right now in this moment, if that's you, just simply say, God, I trust you. God, I love you. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. I trust that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago and shed out all of his blood as the payment for my sin. And not only did he die on that cross, he rose again three days later, giving me victory. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, you said that today for the first time, I'd love to know about it. I'm not gonna call on you or anything, but I just wanna know to be praying for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, today's the day I got a relationship with Jesus. Today is the day I made things right. Jesus, you are so good. Thank you that you wanna be our friends. Thank you that we can call ourselves your friends. God, I pray for this time of offering. Help us to be generous. God, help us to use it in a way that is going to further your kingdom in this community and in this world. God, let Island Community Church be a beacon of hope as we charge forward, God, with your name, the name of Jesus. We pray all of this in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen.